Today's the first Sunday in Lent. Lent is that 40-day season that is set apart in the church year in order to help us prepare for Easter. Now, if it's, if it's a little easy for us to begin to think of Lent as preparing for the celebration of Easter Sunday. And Easter Sunday is really fun. I love all the festivities. I love all the stuff around Easter Sunday. But Lent is not about preparing to celebrate on Easter Sunday. Lent is about preparing ourselves to actually receive once again the invitation from God to follow after his resurrection. And what that means for us is God made a promise to us in the resurrection, a promise of salvation, of eternal life forever, empowering us to actually make a difference in the world. And it takes time every year for us to consider a recommitment to that promise because we are human. And it's so easy for us to make a commitment and mean really well and maybe even do some stuff for a time and then to slowly be tempted off the rails and to lose our way. And so every year the church gives us this chance, this 40 days, to essentially kind of get ourselves back on the path, get ourselves back on the rail, spend a little time, and it's only a little time, preparing ourselves to make that commitment once again. Now, in today's first lesson on this first Sunday of Lent, we hear about a very critical idea in Scripture, and that is the idea of covenant. Covenant is one of those ideas that we might not be so familiar with today. There are certainly obvious examples of covenants where two parties come together and mutually agree on a particular course of action, like, say, marriage. But in most days in our lives, we're not dealing in the world in this idea of mutuality, this covenant reality. And especially when we think of the macro and what's going on in humanity, covenant is something that we might be too easily allowed to kind of set to the side. Today's covenant, we see, is between God and Noah. It is the first of the five big covenants in Scripture. We've got the covenant with Noah, then Abraham, then Moses, then David, and then with Jesus. And I'm going to talk a little bit about each one of those because that's good biblical literacy for us. So the first is, of course, Noah. The flood comes, destroys the world. Noah puts a bunch of stuff on a boat and survives, and the world repopulates and is recreated. The idea here, the way the story is told, is meant to give us a sense that God recreated everything that had happened in the garden. That recreation moment kind of wiped the slate clean, and then God promised never to do that kind of recreation again, that destructive recreation ever again. And then we get a rainbow and we remember every time it rains and the sun is out. That's the first covenant with Noah. That covenant then grows because the promise to not destroy the world again is predicated on the idea that there needs to be a moment of renewal and recommitment. And that second covenant comes with Abraham. When Abraham is promised that all of his descendants will be part of the work of recreating, of turning back toward God, that all of those descendants will be part of the positive influence God wants to make in the world. That's the second covenant. But of course, we know things again get off the rails and the Israelites find Find themselves in captivity in Egypt. And so the third covenant is made at the foot of Mount Sinai after Moses took all of the Israelites out of bondage in Egypt. And that provided a law, a law that created some boundaries around how we were supposed to live. And those boundaries were meant to keep us moving toward God day in and day out worked maybe a little bit, but then it didn't quite work as well as it should have. And so there's another renewal when Israel begs for a king. This is a powerful moment in the grand story because Israel has all of this evidence that God is with them, providing everything they need, and yet they still feel like they need to be like everyone else in the world and have a king. And so when David becomes king, God renews that covenant promise with him, saying that at some point, a descendant of David's would actually come to powerfully recreate everything in the world, recreate the opportunity for us to relate completely to God. And of course, that brings us to the fifth covenant that is fulfilled in the person of Jesus. It is that experience of Christ 
the death and defeat of death and resurrection that brings us to the covenants that we ourselves have inherited. Now, each new covenant is a powerful moment, but each new covenant happens because people are tempted away from God. That temptation is powerful and it keeps messing us up over and over again. There is a common thread throughout all of these covenant stories of temptation. And when I say temptation to you, what do you think? Temptation's powerful. Church talks about temptation. We speak of temptation in our daily lives. And my guess is when I say the word temptation to you, it brings up a negative thought. We are tempted to do things like waste time. We are tempted to do things like eat too much junk food. We are tempted to hurt other people. We are tempted towards selfishness. Temptation can ride the whole gamut, but I bet most of us think of something negative when we think of temptation. But what if temptation wasn't always bad? What if temptation can actually be good? Our human condition is kind of based in this idea of temptation. It is difficult for us to resist things that tempt us in the world. And although, yes, many of those things can be negative, what if the positive temptations in the world are ones that we reject along with the bad? Think about all the good ways that you are nudged, the good ways that you are tempted. In moments like this morning, you will most certainly be tempted to consider doing good things. Maybe stay for Sunday school. Maybe show up and serve some community outside yourself. Maybe give a little more than you thought. Maybe pray a little more often than you thought. Lent, the holy season of Lent, could be one big, giant, good temptation. Just call me your great tempter. (laughs) As we begin... This holy season of Lent, think of temptation in a new way. Every one of us in here feels a little bit of a nudge, a little bit of a tingle, a little bit of that desire to do just a little something better today and tomorrow. And Lent is the opportunity for us to make a small temptation commitment to pray every day to perhaps read a little bit more every day, to set aside some time every day where we do something for someone else that might push us just a little up against our comfort zone. We have 40 days, and that is not a long time, to try to move ourselves just a little closer to God. And as we begin to move ourselves and nudge ourselves and lean into that good temptation, we actually begin to prepare ourselves in the very best sense to not only celebrate at Easter, but to accept God's invitation to renew the commitment and to renew the covenant that God makes with us through Christ. God is working on extending that covenant through Christ. And it might be easy for us to wish God would come down and remake that covenant and fix all the chaos and pull us out of the dark pit that our world seems to be in. But the truth is, we are the ones who are God's hands and feet in the world. We are the ones who are being called to help climb out of that darkness. We are the ones, when we renew our commitment, And when we renew our covenant, together we can actually help change the world for the better. God's current covenant through Christ is with you and with me. We have 40 days to lean into that covenant and together help make the world better so that we renew our commitment to Christ at Easter is a lot more about us changing our lives to change the world. Amen.